Welcome to this weekend drive edition of Daily Drive for the first weekend, April 2024. I'm Jamie Butters, executive editor of Automotive News here in Detroit. And I'm Kellen Walker in Las Vegas. Today, we're breaking down some of the biggest stories in the auto industry from the past week and looking forward to what's in store in the days ahead. Today on the show, we'll hear what J.D. Powers Tyson Jomini has to say about our decision at Automotive News to no longer classify Tesla as a luxury brand. That's coming up in a few minutes, but first, Jamie, how are you? Welcome to the weekend. Good, Kel, thanks. I'm excited about this weekend. Uh, we have a special guest with us, Automotive News retail reporter, Gail Howe. Gail, welcome to Weekend Drive. Thanks, Jamie. Um, you know, you're here because you are on our mighty buy-sell team. Uh, we've been doing this for a few years now where, you know, we really try to cover every auto retail merger and acquisition. Uh, they call them buy-sells, right, with the dealerships. But, um, you know, when these companies change hands, when dealerships change hands, it really, it can change, you know, the shape of the competition within a local market and throughout the country. Um, so we do, we track that. And then we publish every year our list of the top 150 dealership groups based in the U.S. Kind of interesting, you know, they, they, um, there's not really any change at the top. We're, we're looking at uh, a lot of the same companies that we usually do. Um, you know, it's of course, right. I'm trying to find the list here, but of course it's, you know, Lithia, Auto Nation, Penske. I mean, the entire top 10 stayed the same, uh, but they did keep growing. These, uh, the, the, the consolidation trend is continuing, right, Gail? Right. So my colleague, Julie Walker, and I agree that consolidation is continuing at a brisk pace amongst the dealership groups in our top 150 list. Um, the data showed that acquisitions and increased availability of vehicles last year translated into an uptick in new vehicle sales volumes at several of the top 150 dealership groups. And those groups continue to own more and more of the overall dealership count in the U.S. Um, if you drill down even further in the data, we saw that the top 10 groups owned 9.3% of US franchise dealerships, and that was up from 8.9% the previous year. And that was the highest it's been since 2011. And Gail, do we expect to see that number to continue to grow? I think that the brisk pace of consolidation is continuing from what we know from analysts and industry experts elsewhere. Um, consolidation is not stopping this year, despite the dips in dealer profits. Um, it seems that dealers who are rich in cash um, are eager to pour that money back into the industry that they know and um, feel comfortable with investing in. I'm wondering, you know, like I said at the start, uh, the top 10 really didn't change. They they all got a little bigger. Uh, but was there anything that really stood out to you? Who made a big move? So of the top 150, Safford Automotive Group made the biggest jump on the list. Um, and that jump, uh, once again, going back to the acquisition theme, that jump was a result of a mega acquisition that Safford made in 2022. Um, and so Safford ended up doubling its new vehicle retail sales in 2023. From the previous year, it rose 49 spots year over year, and now it's number 38 on our list. Um, and as you said, Lithia Motors um, kept its top spot at number one, again, as it continues its acquisition streak. Um, to be sure, though, acquisitions didn't always translate into groups moving up on the list. Um, for example, Ed Morse Automotive Group um, added nine dealerships last year. However, the group fell one spot to number 53 on the list. Um, but Teddy Morse, CEO of the group, um, spoke to us, and he said he's still looking to expand this group. And he says that the step down on the list um, just shows him that the industry is growing and that it's healthy. And he says it's a positive for his group, too. Interesting stuff, Gail. Uh, now, just to share some of the process, right? We're going to have uh, your column. Uh, you wrote the the lead of the intersection newsletter that goes out on Sunday for our subscribers. And of course, the intersection, some of you know, is really only available to our subscribers. Uh, they will be able through that to be able to get to the list and your story. 
on Sunday. Everyone else can get to it on Monday uh, when it'll be on, on the homepage of autonews.com. We also have some special um, analysis and uh, data sets that people can pour over, uh, but those are behind the paywall to the all access automotive news. Uh, but keep your eyes out. You might see some, uh, some discounts on those subscriptions coming up. Gail, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Cal. Thanks. All right, so Jamie, I have a few questions for you. A lot of news this week. Mm -hmm. uh, Tesla disappointed investors and fans with its first quarter sales down 8.5%, but it actually sold more EVs than China's BYD. Do you think the industry observers jumped too soon to call BYD the number one EV maker globally? Oh, Kel, you know this pushes my buttons. You're getting me started here. <laughs> like, I got so irritated when you know byd won the fourth quarter great they had a great quarter but you don't become number one by having a great month or a great quarter uh it's really should be measured on an annual basis right uh if you win for the year you know sometimes toyota will have a hot month and be ahead of gm but it doesn't mean they're the biggest in the u.s except for the year that they did it <laughs> so i feel like these really should be annual sort of rankings sort of like that's that's the season right? That's the, that's the game. And so, uh, yeah, they really should be, uh, annual, you know, and, and we'll see, I mean, the Chinese market is very, uh, chaotic and in flux right now. Their economy has been really slumping since COVID, although it seems to be going again, you know, it's really hard to tell, but, um, it'll be interesting to see over the course of the year. It's very possible that BYD will be number one this year when all is said and done. Of course, Tesla's having some, some setbacks of its own. Uh, but yes, absolutely, these kinds of rankings should really be looked at on, a, on an annual basis, pretty much an annual basis only. You know as well as I know, though, a headline that says BYD <laughs> is number one over Tesla makes a great headline. Yeah, it gets people very excited. Absolutely. And uh, also, Kia and Hyundai started behind the ball last year, not qualifying for EV tax credits. Fast forward now, a year later, Kia and Hyundai EV sales have doubled. Jamie, what are they doing right? Well, if we take them at their word that they're making money off of them, or at least not losing money, like uh, if the mar that the marginal revenue, the, what, they're, what they're getting in invoice price is uh, enough to cover the, the costs of the materials and the labor to make it, maybe not the development costs and the upfront stuff, um, then, you know, that's good because you don't want to be losing money and driving yourself out of business. But so right. that would help explain maybe why they've done the other thing they're doing right, which is leaning in. You know, uh, you, you, we heard Jose Munoz last week in New York talking about, uh, you know, doubling down on EVs. Uh, they are pushing ahead with their models. Uh, they are still building the plant in Georgia. So they will soon be really ramping up what they are producing and especially what they're producing for the U.S. market. Um, clearly playing the long game, you know, and Hyundai isn't just an all EV uh you know, absolutist as a company, they have maintained throughout that they'd need a mix of powertrains, kind of like Toyota has said with, you know, ICE vehicles, uh, you know, hybrids, plug-in hybrids and pure EVs, uh, fuel cell cars and all that. But where, as where Tesla, Toyota says, we're going to do all of them. It's very few EVs, Hyundai and Kia, the Hyundai Motor Group, are doing all of them and doing a lot of EVs. And uh, it's pretty exciting. And they've had some good success with the Ionic 5 and the Ionic 6. So, and the the Kia, uh, you know, EV9 is doing pretty well, although, you know, big incentives. So we'll, we'll have to see economically how they're doing, but they're bringing vehicles to the market that people want and they're putting the incentives on them to get them to sell. And, you know, Jamie, every time we have some report on something that the Hyundai Group is doing, it never ceased to amaze me just to see where that company was in the early 2000s <laughs> to where they're at now. It is just amazing. And just to be able to watch that and watch that change and that transition, it's just amazing to see. Yeah. You know, Hyundai Motor Group is related to basically the leading 
company in every industry in Korea. It seems like Hyundai Steel, they have their own banking, they have their own shipping. Uh, so, you know, it's a really big, powerful organization, Chai Ball, as they call them uh, in Korean. And um, it's uh, Hyundai has really focused on excellence, uh, quality, fuel economy, and just excellent performance. And here they are, just a, a really f- fantastically different brand. Both brands are in a completely different place than they were 20 years ago. Absolutely. Uh, coming up, J.D. Powers' Tyson Jomini gives Jamie his thoughts about Automotive News' reclassification of Tesla as a mass market brand. That's next on Weekend Drive. Welcome back to Weekend Drive. I'm Jamie Butters with Kellen Walker. If you've been listening to the show, you know we've been hearing a wide range of reactions about our decision to no longer consider Tesla a luxury brand here at Automotive News. You can read my March 15th column about our reasoning at autonews.com. J.D. Power Vice President of Analytics, Tyson Jomini, saw that and had some plenty of thoughts of his own. He wrote about it in a guest column in Automotive News titled, Is Tesla a Luxury Brand or a Mass Market Brand? It's neither. He and I talked about his piece. And uh, one note before we listen to the conversation, we spoke before the news broke late this week that Tesla is scrapping its plans to build a low-priced mass market EV. Here's my conversation with J.D. Powers, Tyson Jomini. Tyson Jomini, welcome back to Daily Drive. Hey, Jamie. Great to be here. Last month, I published a column about why automotive news has stopped listing Tesla with the luxury brands. Like the prices are no longer luxury. It's prioritizing volume over exclusivity. And it just wasn't really a relevant comparison anymore. Uh, but you wrote a guest commentary to share a different point of view. Let's hear it. Yeah, I mean, I guess I've been called to the principal's office over uh, my point of view <laughs> here, huh? So <laughs> just uh, just want to have a conversation. <laughs> Well, it's really more of a of a yes and response. So, um, you know, I I saw what what you published, and uh, and and thought, you know, I'd like to just kind of expand on the conversation a little bit um, to say, yes, Tesla does uh, a lot of things that look like uh, a mass market brand, and yet at the same time, it 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 still maintains a lot of the luxury attributes. So, therefore, yes, it's it's a mass market and it's luxury. Therefore, it's what I'm calling an X brand. Uh, in in sort of Elon Musk parlance, there an mm. X brand, um, which which it, it's kind of both, and uh, we can certainly discuss that. Yeah, I mean, you argue it's sort of a separate category unto itself, but I mean, we don't even really have like a mainstream brand uh, leadership board or category. We kind of we have all the automakers in one list, and then we break out luxury because it's just a different scale, like apples and pineapples. I mean, so. I guess to me, it's like it's it's no longer relevant to keep them with luxury, uh, so we put them with all the others. Uh, I mean, that's the that's the way we mark it up, and that's the way we do it. Uh, do you do you really feel like it's that one of a kind? I mean, isn't that almost the scenario of like the full size truck market where they're um, they're mainstream in a lot of ways, but they're expensive and they're full of the best technology. It's the best marketed products out of Detroit. I mean, arguably those are uh, luxury ish and a separate category unto themselves. Yeah. And, and I mean, a lot of people probably do put trucks in, into their own category and, and view them separately to begin with. Um, but you know, I, I, I want to stay away, I guess, away from price as the primary, uh, uh, you know, line between between two halves of the world, um, because you know the way we view, like to view things certainly at, at JD Power is um, it's not just the sale, but what did the price it take to get to the sale? So if we start to say you know above some threshold is premium or below is is mass market, um, you know it it really takes away from uh, you know there there are brands that do push volume at very low price points and maybe maybe Tesla's falling into that category now, but at the same time. Uh, you know, we do see brands like trucks and others that, that do very well with volume and price at the same time. So for me, I, I really want to avoid saying, OK, uh, you know, it's it, it's over a certain point. Therefore, it's luxury because what's a hundred thousand dollar Jeep Wrangler right now? Like Jeep is you know selling with their final edition V8 models here. I mean, it's a hundred one thousand dollar base price. Is that a luxury vehicle? Um, you know, it just got power seats for the first time. 
<laughs> I would say it's a luxury so, purchase. Uh, whether it's uh, <laughs> luxurious within the realm of of automobiles is, uh, I think you make a good case that it is not. <laughs> yeah, and I'm a longtime Jeep owner. Um, I have what I think is a very expensive Wrangler. I can't even believe you know I spent as much as I did to begin with. Um, and knowing that there's still a you know almost 50% higher uh, ceiling for the brand beyond what I paid. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, so obviously it is a very expensive, a very, you know, it's a price that you do have to be uh, very wealthy to to afford. But yet, I mean, we know that that's not luxury. Um, and, and so, you know, also to your point about the pickup trucks, I mean, those can easily cross $100,000 these days. Um, does that mean that, that pickups are luxurious? I mean, may, maybe they are, um, but certainly, you know, at, at their most basic point, you know, a, a regular cab, two-wheel drive, white, uh, long bed pickup truck is is not necessarily you know luxury. One of the other elements of the discussion, the discourse, and you know, I have this. I've heard uh, takes from all sides. You know, both in 2022 when I wrote about why we were still categorizing Tesla as luxury, and then in 2024 when I explained why we moved it out of luxury, uh, the design is so polarizing. Uh, the the approach to it. Uh, there are some who say, you know, Tesla's never been luxury because their design is so basic, uh, it's so simple. Uh, and then, of course, the build quality, that's sort of another another element to it. But I think there are others who look at Tesla design and they're like, that is sleek. You know, that is clean. Uh, and and it also, as you noted, really sparked the trend toward oversized screens. Yeah. Yeah, and I think most of the complaint comes comes about the interior design. I mean, the exterior, and I would say Model S is uh, probably already established itself as an iconic design, and certainly one of the, if not the ever sexiest sedan. I mean, I'm I'm not even a you know a Tesla super fan here, but I would just say that the Model S design is 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 fairly timeless and iconic. Uh, maybe it's overdue for a freshening. Uh, maybe, maybe that's uh, another way of looking at it. Uh, but the interiors, I think, really draw the, the criticism of that it's not a luxurious product um, because of the materials are, are not quite what you would expect, maybe of a, of a BMW or uh, Mercedes Benz. Uh, but of course, you know, as mentioned, they do put all their technology into that screen. Um, and, and no matter what Tesla you get, you're going to have that interior screen, which I think, quite honestly, you know, the, the level of tech and the level of um, interoperability you get from the screen, um, like it, it knows who you are, it knows your profile. Um, you know, you walk up to the car and you get in it and it's going to change it from, you know, my wife's name to my name. Um, and so it just you get a level of of luxury, I think, from that technology experience that is, you know, more than making up for, uh, you know, the Spartan interiors, which are intentional, minimalistic, uh, you know, very, uh, very simple interiors that they have. Yeah, I mean, and, and that was, I think, again, back to my 22 piece, um, the technology you know, and, and we can, people can quibble, are there too many things layered into the screen? Does it make you too vulnerable to, you know, software glitches and whatnot? But, um, you know, it's over the air updates, you know, that add value, <laughs> give you new toys in your car without having to buy a new car. Uh, the automated driving assist systems, you know, again, a lot of quibbles because they use words like autopilot and full self-driving that drive some people crazy uh, because it's not what most of us think of autopilot. It's not literally full self-driving. It's a brand name. Uh, so it's, um, you know, those are frustrating, but look, I mean, until super cruise and blue cruise, those were by far the best driver assistance systems on the road. I mean, to the extent that people believe that they do almost drive themselves or can sort of drive themselves on a, on a good, on a well-painted highway. Um, you know, just there, there is a lot of value in that technology in the having the most advanced charging network available. I mean, there was, there's luxury in that as well. So I think, you know, it's, it's not a simple clean break by any stretch. Right. But then what are you guys doing with like Model S and Model X? I mean, at the, at the highest end, I mean, Model S doesn't compete against, um, you know, the Toyota Crown. I mean, what, what, where are you, what are you doing with those vehicles? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, if we were doing a deep look at what exactly is happening in the luxury market, we might pull them back in as well as some of the other outliers among other brands. But I mean, they were less than 4% of Tesla's sales last year. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not worried about uh, skewing Tesla's rank in the overall market that way. In the same way that when Volkswagen had the Phaeton, 
uh, you know, we didn't, I don't think anybody hardly broke that out as a separate luxury category or to make sure that those, you know, 12 sales a month were counted uh, among the luxury total. Right. But so when we look at Model Y, for instance, a Model Y dual range, which is the, the all wheel drive Model Y, um, it's priced within $100 of the Mercedes GLC all wheel drive. Um, so it's almost exactly line priced against what I would say is its most uh, sort of comparable, uh, you know, German compact SUV. Um, so it's with $100. But then, of course, it qualifies for uh, the $7,500 uh, IRA funds, which then takes, you know, payments down really far. In the case of lease payments, takes it down basically, you know, to RAV4 type payment levels. But its visual pricing is is very uh, similar to uh, to what we would see on uh, on any luxury car. Model 3 is priced a little bit more aggressively uh, than, than Model Y, but Model Y is, is, is priced right against the Germans. Right, visual pricing. That's, that's good. Uh, that's sort of like, that's the sticker price basically. Yeah. yeah. I mean, right. The MSRP. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of your arguments for why Tesla should still be considered luxury is that it's defectors act more like Mercedes defectors than say Honda or Hyundai, uh, customers would be, I guess my, caution there, you know, the people leaving the brand over the past year or so almost certainly bought their car before last year's massive price cuts, right? And so when they bought it, when I would still consider it considered Tesla a luxury brand, I guess I'll be, and you had some really great data in, uh, in your piece, uh, <laughs> Tesla's average transaction prices coming down by 34% over 15 months from $70,000 to 46. I'll be curious to see the data on Tesla defectors in, in three or four years, or especially five years after that, when presumably the Model 2 will be more in the mix. It seems like, and again, part of my argument and our argument as Automotive News was that where the company is going is again, away from exclusivity and toward mass appeal as they try to get down even below $30,000 price threshold. Yeah, I mean, they certainly have a, a stock price and a an expectation of of growth that they're trying to maintain. Uh, you know, perhaps more than an explicit share goal per se. They have a, a stock price goal in, in effect, uh, which is to maintain a, a high price, and a lot of their employees are compensated with with equity plans based on the stock price, and um, you know, including the the CEO himself. So there there's a lot of of emphasis on the price of the stock, and that does maintain or require them to maintain. A uh, very high sales rate. Therefore, you see that kind of pressure. Um, but of course, you know one thing we've seen here in the U.S. and you know depending on which way elections go or which way uh, you know regulators go, um, that seventy-five hundred dollars, you know, it can be taken away if not quite tomorrow, but you know very quickly. And if so, now we're talking about you know an automaker with with very much premium prices um, without that seventy-five hundred dollar you know, tailwind, which brings payments down so much. Um, that that you know we're basically looking at a, a a luxury competitor priced against other other luxury players. Now the introduction of Model Two, I think, would take a lot of the volume pressure off Model Three and Model Y, and allow them to be more upstream since they will have a model down at the lower end, pulling the weight of of sort of that entry play there. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned in our our data, what we see is you know those who defect from Mercedes and BMW uh, tend to return to other premium makes about you know, let's call it in the 40% range. Um, and that's exactly where we find those that trade in a Tesla and return to the franchise market. They're going premium about 40% of the time. Um, and that is significantly above what we would see from the likes of Toyota and Hyundai and others, uh, which would be, you know, more around the 10% range. Um, so what we've seen, and to your point, and, you know, not, not to step around that, uh, what happened in the past may not indicate the future, uh, but those who have been buying Tesla's, you know, that are trading them in. So we're talking consumers that have owned it for, you know, between four and seven or eight years on average um, are, are very much premium uh, owners that are going to other premium makes uh, when, they, when they get out of Tesla. Now, it's not to say, you know, 60% still go to mainstream. Um, so you, you get a lot of buyers going that way still. Um, but overall, the, the rate of those that return to the premium space looks very similar to Mercedes and BMW. Well, there's going to be a, a lot more time for us to watch how the Tesla story plays out. And I look forward to talking about it with you more in the future. Tyson Jomini is Vice President of Data and Analytics at J.D. Power. Thanks so much for joining me today. Appreciate it, Jamie. Thanks for having me on.
That's all for this weekend drive edition of Daily Drive. I'm Jamie Butters. And I'm Kellen Walker. Thanks to Automotive News Coordinating Producer Jake Neer for his help on today's podcast. You can get the latest news on new products, electrification, and everything happening in the auto industry at autonews.com. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you think of the show and the topics we covered today. Send us an email at dailydrive at autonews.com or leave us a voicemail at 313-444-2774. If you enjoy the podcast, remember to like, leave a review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode.